great and peaceful river in a land that's fair to see where the douglas fir tree whispers to the snow-capped mountain breeze where the cliffs are solid granite and the valley is always green this is just as close to heaven as my traveling feet have been roll columbia won't you roll 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 columbia won't you roll 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 A century and a half ago, Thomas Jefferson envisioned an empire of freedom and opportunity in the far Northwest. His bold determination sent Lewis and Clark westward through the wilderness, down the course of America's greatest power stream. To countless Americans, the Columbia has been a river of hope, a shining symbol of plenty, and men have followed the great river of the West down to the Pacific to sow their crops and cut the timber, to build a colonial empire, sending out its boundless resources to the far corners of the earth. Upstream and in the mountain tributaries, the Columbia has been a wild and uncontrolled giant. Boiling over rapids and cataracts, 30 million horses plunged relentlessly to the sea. From the beginning of time, this power roared unharnessed to the Pacific. Only the returning salmon, instinctively fighting their way upward to spawn, could defy the crashing falls and cascades. untamed, the same swirling fury which Indians whipped for salmon since the days of Captain Meriwether Lewis. With the depression of the 30s, the nation again looked hopefully to the northwest frontier, seeking opportunity in a still undeveloped country. But the Northwest, too, was feeling the impact of a worldwide depression. More than half the industrial workers were in forest industries. And the world no longer called for the logs and lumber of the Northwest. Mills were abandoned, some never to reopen. So there were no jobs for incoming workers. Everywhere, the same story. Men looking for work, not finding it. On the heels of the unemployed came the victims of the Dust Bowl, as the Columbia beckoned to a people burned out by wind and drought. mighty hard road that our poor hand has hold and our poor feet has traveled a hot dusty road out of the dust bowl and westward we rolled and your deserts are hot and your mountains are cold we travel with the wind and the rain in our face our families migrating from place unto place. 
We work in your beet fields till sundown tonight. Travel 300 miles for the morning gets light. Arizona, California, we'll make all your crops. Then it's northward to Oregon to gather your hops. Strawberries, cherries, and apples the best in that land full of promise at Pacific Northwest. So the migrants came to the heart of the great Columbia River Basin to find land as burned and useless as the dust-stricken acres they had left behind. Eight inches of rain a year, too little for any crop. A year or two and the surface water was gone. And so were the farmers. An endless string of refugees from the Dust Bowl gazed at the arid acres and moved on. Broken wagon wheels, bleached cattle bones, were warning enough. If they were to find land, they must first bring the Columbia water to the lifeless acres. And Grand Coulee Dam was the answer. Uncle Sam, he took the challenge in the year of 33 For the farmers and the workers and for all humanity Now, River, you can ramble where the sun sets in the sea But while you're rambling, River, you can do some work for me Roll, Columbia, won't you roll, roll, roll Roll, Columbia, won't you roll, roll, roll A challenge to reclamation engineers to match the wonders of the Ice Age, to duplicate the glacial dam which centuries before had blocked the Columbia. To make a million acres bloom anew, build an industrial empire from the wasted power of the Columbia. Not useless leaf-raking, but productive public works. They moved mountains and froze a landslide, laid down 10 million yards of concrete. From the rocky canyon where the Columbia River rolls Seen the salmon leaping, the rapids and the falls The big Grand Coulee Dam in the state of Washington Is just about the biggest thing that man has ever done Three times the size of Boulder or the highest pyramid Makes the Tower of Babel a plaything for a kid from the rising of the river to the setting of the sun, the coulee is the biggest thing that man had ever done. I'd better quit my talking cause I told you all I know. But please remember, partner, wherever you may go, I've been from here to yonder, I've been from sun to sun. The coulee dam's the biggest thing that man has ever done. Cynic scoffed, called it a white elephant. But we went ahead, confident the power would be needed in the years to come. 300 miles downstream at Bonneville, the Army engineers faced the fury of half a million feet of water every second. Coffer dams were flooded, equipment swept away. But at last, the project was completed. Bonneville Dam, a symbol of power and passage, opens up a region that has more than 10% of the nation's area, but only 3% of its people. Dams, drought, and unemployment were forgotten when war enveloped the world. From our beleaguered allies came pleas for clouds of planes, for a bridge of ships, 
men and materials we had, factories we could build. But America desperately lacked one vital element, electricity. Electric power, the essential ingredients of aluminum and magnesium, the key to electrochemicals and shipbuilding. In this hour of need, America looked westward to her last great hydroelectric reservoir. In the Northwest, she found a great new source of power to meet the challenge, the Columbia River. At Bonneville, half a million kilowatts to serve the new war plants. The Colossus at Grand Coulee coming into production in the nick of time. the Columbia truly became America's strong right arm. Lifelines of liberty, taking a million horsepower out of the River Canyon. 2,500 miles of shining circuits, using the strength of the Columbia to build ships faster than they were ever built before. Most important of all, making the wings for America. The aluminum for one out of every three of our fighting planes. Half a billion pounds a year, building the fortresses to keep the war from our shores. To turn the tide of battle, save the lives of our fighting men. In the barren hills below Grand Coulee, the stream grew warmer. And almost magically, the atomic bomb was born. Thus, the power of the Columbia helped bring our boys back from the Pacific two years sooner than they had dared hope. Look down in the canyon and there you will see Grand Coulee showers her blessings on me My land I'll defend with my life if it be, cause my pastures of plenty must always be free. With the war over, more and more people flocked to America's fastest growing region. And the nation cried out for the materials the Northwest could produce, especially lumber, to meet the national housing crisis. Night and day, engineers work to bring power to the new plants. Soon, the power of the Columbia was producing more than half the nation's supply of aluminum. A single rolling mill sending its metal to 600 factories from Texas to New England for trains and trucks, roofs and siding, and countless everyday items. On the Columbia River, the atomic energy plant calls for more electric power as science turns this discovery to mankind's betterment. Even the world's largest generators are insufficient to meet the mounting demands for power. New dams must be built, or America's vital electro industries will fail to develop or be forced to go abroad for their power. Industry we can ill afford to lose. With too little power, the Northwest is suddenly faced with the irony of too much water. A late spring, and the melting snows of the Snake and Northern tributaries pour together into the Columbia. Without a series of dams upstream to store the excess water, it rushes unchecked to the sea. A million cubic feet every second at Bonneville. And Vanport, 
Oregon's second largest city, is swept away by the angry waters. The homes of 20,000 people afloat, beaten to kindling. Men and women who hopefully had sought refuge from dust and drought and depression. Still holding the dream of a farm, a job, a home in the Valley of the Columbia. We worked in your orchards of peaches and prunes. And we slept on the ground neath the light of the moon. We picked in your cotton, cut the grapes from your vine to set on your table your light sparkling wine. It takes home-loving mothers and strong-hearted men. Every state in this union us migrants has been. Along the edge of your cities you'll see us and then we have come with the dust and we're gone with the wind. More than 50 people dead. Tens of thousands homeless. Over a hundred million dollars lost. Thirty million wild horses cast loose to trample the homes and the hopes of people of the Northwest. If we are to control the restless Columbia, we must first develop it. Develop it for all its value from the glacial headwaters to the Pacific. Government engineers say it can be done, and water power is the magic partner in making this development possible. Bonneville and Grand Coulee are only the beginning. 10 million horsepower of new energy swiftly can be harnessed on America's mightiest stream. Tame the hazardous rapids. Open the Columbia Waterway to navigation 500 miles inland. Provide endless water power to meet the grave electric shortage. Conserve our vital oil supply. Reclaim another million acres of dry but fertile land. Already, the power of Grand Coulee is paying a large share of the irrigation costs. 80 acres of garden land for the farmer burned out by dust and drought. A chance for the little fellow in the Big Bend country. Flood control must start high up in the headwaters, on the Kootenay, in the Flathead, in the Clark Fork. Provide water power to pay for the mighty dams that must be built. But you cannot control the Columbia unless you control its tributaries, including the mighty Snake River, which flows a thousand miles through Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. In the heart of America's deepest canyon, government engineers have recommended a project as big as Boulder Dam. Hell's Canyon, a million kilowatt dam, will create a 91-mile lake to hold back the unruly waters of the snake. Key dam in providing protection for the lower Columbia power to turn the nation's largest phosphate reserves into precious plant food for which a hungry world cries out. Power to extend the frontiers of opportunity for countless men and women who look westward hopefully for land and jobs, for security and happiness. Today, the inexhaustible power of the Columbia is speeding housing for all our people giving birth to half the nation's supply of vital aluminum. Tomorrow, it can do infinitely more, for America's greatest power stream is still less than one-tenth developed. 30 million horsepower wasting to the sea. A tremendous force for good or for evil. So the mighty Columbia flings a challenge to a nation daring it to show that our democracy has the vitality to develop a great river for all its values, for all its people. 
set a pattern for the other nations of the world to follow. Prove they can have food as well as freedom, peace as well as plenty. That is the challenge of the Columbia. Yeah.